It is. It's Thursday. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, we have a very special guest tonight. Father Mitch Packer is going to be joining us. Um, remember to definitely ask questions in the sidebar there. You can ask questions to us. Um, also, if you would uh, like to uh, just join in the, con- the conversation anytime as well. Uh, tonight, Father Mitch Packer is going to share that people we'll bring him in from Alabama. And uh, he's got some, some great words of advice for us coming up. I want to thank um, Solidarity Health Share and uh, Catholic Order of the Foresters for supporting our efforts and bringing these big time interview conversations straight to your living room. And uh, so without further ado, we will try to bring in Father Mitch Packwood here in a minute. Um, hang on for a second as we try and pull him in. Father, you'll be here in about one second, hopefully. There he is. Can you hear me? How are you doing? Good. Good, good, good. Thanks for joining us tonight. Sure. It's a pretty night out here. Uh, I don't know what it's like out by y'all, but it's uh, it's pretty out here. Father, we're, 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 you invited us into your uh, your home tonight. Tell us a little bit about yeah. it. What do you got around <laughs> there? Oh, uh, critters. Uh, Want to see my pet cat? <laughs> <laughs> you got critters everywhere, huh? Well, good. Well, yeah, actually, actually, I have. I better get that light out of the way. Um, I, I actually have um, uh, two feral cats. Um, one of them just came to the door. In fact, and he uh, he and his sister wa- wandered up uh, onto. Uh, my back porch, and I started to feed feed them. Yeah, so you can see him over there sniffing around. Oh yeah, yeah. and nice nice old cat. Um, and uh, sister's a litter mate, so we have them both. Uh, and you know, this is one of the choices animals make. They let me feed them. Yeah, or I let them feed me. Right. <laughs> we'll get into that in a little bit about your passion for hunting and you know yeah. it's a great yeah. again for making time to talk with all of us during um, sure. sure. these these crazy times uh first mm-hmm. father for a lot of folks that might be tuning in watching that may not be as familiar with you as many are being a personality on television and your mm-hmm. priesthood and everything maybe give a background very quickly about you know who you are and, and what you accomplished in the amazing uh, priestly career that you had. Well, it's starting to turn into a long career. Uh, this uh, June, I'll be a priest for 44 years. And uh, I've been in the Jesuits now for almost 52 years. Uh, entered the society back in 68. Um, I'm originally from Chicago, uh, but my family had traveled around quite a bit. Uh, we lived in Florida uh, for a number of years, a little bit in Colorado and Cleveland. Uh, but eventually came back to Illinois and settled in Chicago. And that uh, I was living there. Uh, I actually started seminary when I was 14 years old. Uh, they, we still had minor seminaries in those days. And I went to one of those. So I'm something of a lifer. And to give perspective on that, I started minor seminary, 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 uh, cemetery is my next destination, but uh, hopefully we're down the road a bit. But the, uh, I started high school seminary while the Vatican Council was still in session. So in, in 63, it was still going on. And uh, there'd be a couple sessions while I was in school. And uh, also that uh, my freshman year is the year uh, that John F. Kennedy was shot. Remember, I was in Latin class with Father Rakowski when uh, uh, we found out that the president was shot. Uh, and you know, by the time I started uh, college, well, yeah, but my first year college, um, you know, it was a time of turmoil. You know, that spring, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. Yep. Uh, in June, it was uh, Robert F. Kennedy was assassinated. I believe also that's when there was an assassination attempt on George Wallace. Um, 
And there were the Chicago uh, Democratic Convention riots mm -hmm. just as I entered the Jesuits. I had nothing to do with those, by the way. <laughs> I wasn't there. Couldn't prove a thing. <laughs> and so... <laughs> And and there was a lot of turmoil throughout the church as well as, as the years went on. It started off as benign uh, desires to be relevant, to be um, uh, you know up to date, a uh, little experimental, but it was basic. But sixty eight clearly marked a change in the church. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the also the year that that July, less just about three weeks before I entered the society, uh, Humanae Vitae uh, was printed out, and the protests by Charles Curran and others came out, and more and more turmoil inside the church took place. Um, by the time I was I started my theology training, and uh, I, I finished the mission in college um, and taught high school for a couple of years, like most Jesuits, right. and then studied theology. And there we saw a lot of uh, women who wanted to be ordained uh, to the priesthood were studying there with us. Um, and we had to deal with these questions, um, important questions, some of which have not totally gone away. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the, these were, uh, were part of it. And then, and, and you know, it was something I've told a number of people. You know, all through the high school seminary, novitiate, my college training my, for philosophy, and my teaching, and my, my first years of studying theology, I didn't see anything of the same-sex attraction issues that we later on began to see in the church. Hmm. But it started about 76. It was after I was ordained, first time I came across it. And when I, I went away to study again, uh, did my doctoral studies in Old Testament with the New Testament minor at Vanderbilt University in mm -hmm. Nashville, Tennessee. And when I came back, I wondered what happened because all of a sudden there was quite a bit of hubbub about uh, homosexuality and stuff. And I was really quite surprised by it. So, you know, these have been times of a lot of turmoil. I would say a lot of that is calming down, has calmed down, uh, because the sex abuse crisis has certainly been a big issue. And we very much uh, have had to deal with great pain mm -hmm. in coping with, with these situated pain, most especially for the young people. Um, but also for everybody else in the church, because it's a scandal to all of us. Uh, plus, um, the great pain was felt by the families. Uh, just uh, just a, a, a no-win situation mm -hmm. at every level for anybody. Right. It was just quite miserable. Well, well it seems to be a miserable problem. So, you know, just dealing with some of these things has been part of uh, uh, living as a religious and a priest over the last 50 some years. Now, well, Father, thanks for hearing the call and answering about calling you being a priest. Um, real quick, we're going to get into the fun stuff with the words of inspiration and uh get your thoughts on some other things going on today but i noticed as you're walking around you have some uh, some uh, animals on the wall and yeah. you know, I understand first off you speak what 13 languages and you're very passionate about well, it's, it's it's really 12 12 uh, one, one is a variation of a dialect of another so it's really just 12. uh-huh oh <laughs> okay well, uh, how about hunting? We know that you're a, you're a big hunter. You got a lot of passion yeah. for it. How do you, how do you uh, can you relate that to spirituality in a way? 
<laughs> you know, there, there are a lot of aspects of it. Um, I'll never forget one time a lady in my studio audience asked me, Father Mitch, do you ever learn any spiritual lessons when you go out hunting? And I thought, I said, yes, ma'am. One time I took a cotton ball and I tied a string around it and I dipped it in some dough in estrus scent, basically dough urine when, when they're in estrus. Tied it to the back of my boot and I walked along a path where I knew that there had been deer coming through. Then I took that string off my boot, hung it up in a tree branch, got into my stand, and I waited for dawn. Sure enough, 11-point buck came out, and he was just, his nose was to the ground following that scent. He did not look up even once. He walked right into the sights of my rifle. Bam! Knocked him down. And I told her, the lesson that you learn from that is sex makes you stupid and then you die. <laughs> well, Father, I guess, you know, in, in, the, in the right context, that's some great advice for all the young people watching. Uh, that's, no, very, that's true. A lot of truth to that now. Yeah, there is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There it is. Well, that's, that's great. Um, but there's, but the, the, uh, there's another side, too. You know, one of the things about you know, that I love. It's not only the the hunt itself, but it, it's the whole process. You know, we're very uh, uh, careful in selecting the animals that we harvest. You look for animals that are, you know, getting older. And a lot of folks don't realize this, but deer in the wild die of starvation not because there's a lack of food but because their teeth wear down so much they can't eat and they die and sometimes it's not just the starvation what happens is that they get so weak because they can't eat they can't chew mm -hmm. that then the coyotes track them down and I, they're vicious. Mm -hmm. They're just vicious. Yeah. So, you know, that's one of the things we look for, those deer that are more advanced in age. We don't want to shoot uh, young ones. Uh, let them stay in the herd and breed. And you take out some of the older deer so that their genetics don't get overbred. And, then, and that causes various diseases mm -hmm. uh, among the deer. So it's a management deal and that means you have to spend time with the animals and you really get to know some of them and see some of their uh what personality they have they have their own quirks and, and i tell you what it's not the movie bambi out there mm -hmm. those deer are mean to each other once the rut starts right they, those bucks are mean and yeah. you pay attention to that too you know, see which ones win the fights, which ones are not going to be eligible to breed anymore because right. they lose. And those need to be taken out uh, of the herd as well. And then there's, in addition to the actual hunt, which doesn't take that long, um, there's also this other aspect of the skinning and cleaning and the butchering and packaging and then you cook and you share that meat with other folks so that i enjoy all that to me there's a great integrity to that process mm -hmm. you know i i don't you know uh, as a matter of fact i don't buy any red meat in the store i have never hunted any chickens because all the chickens I ever see alive belong to somebody else, so I'm not going to shoot them. But, you know, uh, red meat, I don't even buy in the store anymore. Everything, all the red meat I eat is something I harvested. Oh, that's and, right. Yeah, that's and it's, it's it's lean meat. Yeah. You know, uh, even the wild pigs are, mean, are lean. Mm -hmm. meat. 
So that, that's yeah. you know, uh, seeing the integrity of that whole process and taking part in it, as well as being able to share with other people. Just tonight, uh, I um, roasted some uh, venison oh. uh, and, and was sharing it with uh, a deacon friend of mine that was over. He's making a retreat with me. So. Oh, that's mm-hmm. great, Father. Well, it sounds like you're you're using this time wisely. Everyone, if you're just tuning in, we're talking with Father McPacqua. He just gave us a background of his career so far. Also, it's one of his many passions. Um, thank you for joining us. Please put your questions in the chat so we can answer any questions anyone has. Father, again, thanks for letting us come into your home and allow us to access with you during this time where Folks otherwise may not want to be able to see you in your, you know, in your element. Now, I do want to switch gears here because we're already down to 15 minutes. It's a 30-minute uh, conversation. Um, the purpose sure. of the fire word is for you to give you what you feel God, God is calling you to tell everyone, you know, the hundreds of thousands of yeah. people that will see this. First question I have for you, though, we're going to start with this on the coronavirus. Um, what, is, what is your thought on this idea or the tension? Um, about getting the country back together, and what would be your your message to the families out there struggling through this that don't have a job or you know going through a ton of new challenges they've never had before? But specifically, this tension of let's get the country back. We need to be that type of that type of mentality. What do you think about that right now going on? We have, uh, and it is a tension. That's the, exactly the right word. There's a tension between protecting our population from the spread of this virus, which in its first stage is asymptomatic. You don't see symptoms even though you are carrying it. And most people apparently, it's turning out, most people don't show any symptoms. It doesn't affect them that much. Um, But there are others, especially when uh, their, their respiratory or coronary system is weakened that they can die so it's very high risk and we just and half of the problem we have is we don't know who has it and who doesn't who has antibodies and so on in that ignorance there is more confusion and that's a great difficulty um the other side of the tension and uh, besides protecting the health of many people. The other side of the tension is we have to get the economy going because we also live on the basis of the economy, not just because it's a job, but it's what keeps the food moving and the other products necessary for life. And this is the tension. Now, one of the things we have to watch for, sometimes as our politicians, along with our citizenry, but especially our politicians and people uh, in the highly politicized media, as we see with a lot of them, the problem is they see a successful or a failed economy as a basis for gaining power. If the economy goes bad, the incumbent can be taken out of office. If the economy goes well, the incumbent can get the credit for it. And we don't want, some people don't want the incumbent to get the credit. Some people um, want him to get credit. And they promote things on the basis of political power expediency rather than that tension between the need to get people working and the economy rolling again and the protection of the vulnerable. Those two tensions must be kept in mind by people with good sense and people of faith who are not trying to either bring down the administration or support the administration. Those political power expediencies ought not to figure in our accounting, but rather keeping a balance 
of what is going to uh, help us take care of one another, both in protecting from sickness, and that usually is something based on various legitimate fear, and the need to uh, get people fed, clothed, and housed, uh, and the law, the fear of loss of the economy and the means of support so that we don't go back into another Great Depression such as occurred in the 1930s. Those are both legitimate fears. Mm -hmm. and we have to use wisdom to protect life and protection of life, not politicians, has to be our primary goal. They're meant to serve us. Right. And right. what they do should serve the common good. And we have to be very much involved in asking questions about what is going to be for the common good on both sides of that spectrum of the issue. Right. Well, Father, that along with what you just said there, which is really well said, we got a question from a Melissa Lee. Uh, she wants to know if you could comment, how do we protect our faith while trying to protect our health right now? Do we just accept watching Mass online or on TV, or should we do something more to the public Mass right now? Um, in, uh, something more than oh, 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 something more than mass. I thought I said a mask, uh, because of course masks are an issue. Um, no, 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 a mask. You know, here's here's one of the things. A lot of us are stuck in our homes, right? We can't go out, and I think everybody notices even more how many commercials there are on TV. And one of the nice things about uh, the various ways that EWTN operates, we don't do commercials, and what we do have is the Mass and the Rosary and the Divine Mercy Chaplet, each of which is offered at different times of the day so that everybody can share in that kind of uh, prayer. And even though you cannot be at the live mass, the priest celebrating the mass is in union with Jesus Christ, the head of the body of Christ, the head of the church. And in Jesus, he is united to every single member of the church as we celebrate those masses. So, yeah, you cannot be there physically. We, we can't even let m our own employees come to the masses. It tears us up. It tears us up. My pastor, you know, at the Maronite parish in town, has been celebrating the liturgies every day. We make them available on Facebook from St. Elias uh, Church here in Birmingham. It's on Facebook. People join us. And he says, you know, the Mass seems so long to me now because the people aren't there. When the people are there, we priests are engaged in this great relationship. And it just flies by. Whereas now it, it, it seems more long to us. We miss being with the folks. But that doesn't mean that we are not in union with them, even when they're not there. So joining with us in prayer and spiritually being in communion is great. But to use the other devotions of our Catholic faith. And some of our shows, my show on Tuesday and other programs, do Bible studies. You can do Bible study with us. And a lot of what we're offering, I'm telling you, is a lot healthier than what you've seen in a lot of the other media. Right. There's a lot of right. nasty stuff. So Absolutely. this is something that all of us can deepen our faith, especially those who grew up in the last 50 years and didn't get good catechesis. Well, this is a good time to sort of make up for some of that. Right, absolutely. Father, yeah, 
couldn't agree with you more. You're welcome, Melissa. Uh, question, Father, just switching gears real quick. This is kind of interesting. Sandy wants to know, what part of your ministry do you find most inspiring and why? Well, definitely the high point of my ministry is celebrating Mass. You know, this is where, you know, um, I'm also very much in need of the Eucharist, just as you are, you know, as lay people. I need to be there with Jesus. And being able to celebrate, um, and I, I, you can't push the analogy too far, but, you know, we priests celebrate the Mass and all the other sacraments as the church teaches at Vatican II, we do so in persona Christi, in the person of Christ. That's why I, we, we say the words, this is my body. I don't say this is Jesus' body or his body. I say this is my body. I am saying that in the person of Christ. I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and so on. I act in the person of Christ. And as such, like Christ, I look to the church to be my bride. Christ is the bridegroom of the church, and the church is his bride. And I see that. And for me, the celebration of Holy Mass is the, the part of my day and the part of my ministry where I am most deeply sharing with my bride, the church. I taught university and high school for over 20 years. Mm. And now TV for uh, TV. I've been doing this for 36 years. Okay. And one of the th teaching a class does not tire me or take as much out of me as does celebrating mass. It is something that nourishes me, but also, you know, I, I give of myself more. And I think that that's because the Holy Spirit is the one doing it. That by far, far none, is the most important part of my ministry. Oh, that's great, Father. I, I, that's a profound statement, even saying over high schoolers, because we can take a lot out of you. So, you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, well, Father, that's great. We're coming down uh, to the end of time here. So what would be great if you would please give your words of inspiration, uh, the words of advice that you have to all the families watching, maybe how they should spend this time together. You know, uh, whether it's practicing new prayer efforts or putting new prayer structure in their life, whatever you do, whatever you feel called to say. And then if you want to end it with a blessing and a, and a, and a blessing for us. Yep. Um, here's, here's the thing I would say. Um, first of all, uh, as much as you can, um, take time to pray as a family. That's been lost. Family prayer has been lost in uh, American Catholic life. We need to get back to it. And we don't eat together, uh, yet alone pray together. So that's going to be very key. Secondly, studying together, learning more about the faith. And, dealing, and, and parents get involved in doing the homework, especially dads. The studies show consistently that men who help their kids with homework have a really big impact, and that's very, very important. So that, that's a good thing. Thirdly, I would say to look for family projects together. So some of my friends are learning to bake. They, I, you know, one one's really sweet uh, family I, I, I'm close to, um, uh, you know, they, they are learning how to bake. And does that mean that everything will turn out perfectly? Not yet, but they get better and better as you learn the techniques. And to learn that as a fan and have adventures, because it really is adventuresome to cook. And those adventures of doing projects like cooking or sewing or some other thing, those kind of tasks become the basis of family stories for generations. So that's another thing. The last thing I would mention is that in addition to prayer and study, look for the kind of programs that are humorous. I don't know how to do some of this, but you can, uh, on some channels and some services you get, 
You can download movies, get comedies, watch the Marx Brothers, Laurel and Hardy, and other comedies, and laugh together. That is going to be a great reduction of tension, and especially the little kids haven't even seen all the Bugs Bunny cartoons yet. Those are great. And I urge you to do that. That's where I learned to be a wise guy. So I urge you to learn you know, to, more about humor and laughing together and a lot of the tensions that exist by staying in the house all the time will be reduced. All right? Thank you. And, Lord, and may the Lord bless you all and keep you, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, thank you so much for the, the words of encouragement. Families being able to be invited into your home like this is just a real treat. Everyone, sure. like, more and more. Confident. Let me just show you my, my one critter. Now, oh, this yeah. is something that, Joe, you had asked if I named him. <laughs> now, see, tell everybody that's that. something that I never do. I never name these animals. You name pets. You eat the animals in the woods. Yeah. <laughs> well, I learned a lesson tonight. I think we all did, too. <laughs> yeah, you don't name dinner. Uh, that's right. <laughs> well, Father, thank you. Uh, all thank right. You God for, bless you all. Thank you for hearing the call, becoming a priest. Thanks for your ministry, and we'll see you soon, Father. Thanks so much. God, God bless you all. God bless your work. God bless you. Sure. All right. Take care.